Mosaic, a daily news program from Worldlink TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Bush will address the American people at 1 a.m. GMT, and it is expected that Bush will give Iraqi President Saddam Hussein a final warning. The U.S. Secretary of State says that the Security Council has failed, since it could not unite and support the U.S.'s efforts to disarm Iraq. Parliamentary leader Robin Cook resigns from the British government in protest of Blair's policies on Iraq. The United States, Britain and Spain withdraw their second proposal on Iraq. Meanwhile, the Security Council is conducting a closed consultation meeting on Iraq to discuss the fate of the war. Today, the UN Secretary General will announce his decision to recall the UN inspectors from Iraq. Meanwhile, 12 Palestinians were killed today by the occupation forces in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip while the Palestinian Legislative Council postpones discussing the Prime Minister's duties until tomorrow. Now, to our correspondent in Ramallah, Majid Saeed. There are differences in opinions between the legislative and executive authorities. The differences are focused on three issues that the Prime Minister must first refer to President Arafat before any changes or reforms to the government. Furthermore, the Palestinian president will still have the ability to summon the government's meetings. This is the end of the news in brief. Welcome to the news. The entire world is holding its breath in anticipation of a declaration of war, which Washington may announce tonight. Hours from now, the United States President George Bush will address the American people, declaring the end of the diplomatic process and declaring the start of a war. However, President Bush said that the course of events could change only if President Saddam Hussein left Iraq and relinquished his power. Meanwhile, United States Secretary of State Colin Powell paved the way for President Bush's speech. During a press conference just a while ago, Powell said that the only choice left to the Iraqi president and a number of other Iraqi leaders is to leave Iraq. In a press conference at the State Department's headquarters in Washington, Powell said that the U.S. president will give a final warning to the Iraqi president. Powell also strongly criticized the Security Council, saying that they failed to support the United States' efforts to disarm Iraq. As these new developments are shaping, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan is expected to announce tonight that he will recall the United Nations inspectors from Iraq. This development came after the United States, Britain and Spain withdrew their second resolution on Iraq. It is to be noted that the General Director of the International Atomic Energy, Mohammed al baradi stated earlier that Washington has advised him to withdraw their United Nations inspectors from Iraq. Observers in Kuwait said that several eyewitnesses reported that a number of United Nations inspectors in Iraq have concluded their work and left their hotels today as part of an evacuation process. Meanwhile, the United States is preparing to launch the war against Iraq. As part of a security plan, international observers on the borders between Iraq and Kuwait are evacuating from the Kuwaiti side of the borders amidst the United States' preparations for a war against Iraq. A number of observers have actually left this border area, as we can see in this exclusive Abu Dhabi footage. Now we go to our correspondent in Baghdad, Shakir Hamid, for a more detailed report on the latest developments on the days before the attack on Iraq. In Iraq, summer has begun earlier than usual. Meanwhile, the development of events is getting hotter. This is the highest moment of anticipation of the U.S.-British attack on Iraq. In Baghdad, Iraq's perception of the U.N. inspectors has changed. They were perceived as a safety pad against unilateral and spontaneous action, also known as international legitimacy. 
especially since the coalition that has been pressuring Baghdad and the Security Council has decided that the truth could only be revealed through war. We will not tire and we will continue to work with the Security Council to prove the truth. The honest truth is that there aren't any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We want the entire world to be certain of this. Those who are selling war fear this reality. Iraq's determination to prove the truth is supported by the international community's rejection to war. However, Iraq had previously doubted that the Security Council will be able to solve the conflict in Iraq's favor. Iraqis are holding their breath in anticipation of the decisive moment, which means that the war is imminent. If it happens or doesn't happen, we will remain steadfast. You can expect anything from America. But if God is willing, we will be stronger than them, and we will fight. Life in Baghdad carries on peacefully, but with hidden tensions revealed by the barricades and trenches that are on the streets of Baghdad. Meanwhile, Iraqi diplomacy continues in two directions. First, trying to reinforce its compliance with the Security Council's resolution by sending more detailed reports, proving that they have indeed destroyed their nerve gas. Second, a direction that shows that they are prepared not only for a military confrontation, rather that they are taking measures to protect their border areas in the south, especially after the international observers withdrew from the disarmed zone on the borders with Kuwait. This brings the events to almost a direct confrontation between the two armies even before the decisive hour. When the battle starts on a wide scale, he must understand that the battle between us will occur anywhere, whether land, air, or sea, all over planet Earth. Amidst the diplomacy of peace and the diplomacy of war, there is still a small chance of hope. Shakir Hamid, Abu Dhabi Television, Baghdad. Iraqi Information Minister Mohammed Saeed al sahaf on Monday blasted the U.S.-British Spanish summit of the outlaws over the weekend, saying the Allies wanted to try out new arms in a war against Iraq. Meeting in Portugal on Sunday, U.S. President George W. Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair, along with Spain's Prime Minister Jose Maria Othnar, gave uh, Monday night as a deadline for the UN Security Council to support a new resolution widely seen as a trigger for an invasion of Iraq. With war clouds growing dark over Iraq, Iraqis continued their preparations for US-led aggression against their country. The US, meanwhile, ordered all government dependents and non-essential staff out of several countries in the region. The details in this report. Residents of the Iraqi capital Baghdad lined up for petrol and snapped up canned food and bottled water on Monday as diplomatic efforts to avert a threatened U.S.-led attack on their country appeared to falter. Across the city, people mobbed pharmacies to buy antibiotics and tranquilizers, while workers sandbagged positions outside government buildings. At Baghdad's biggest market, the George Market, people were keen to buy dust masks and portable kerosene cookers, as well as emergency food supplies. Some store owners have moved their merchandise to the relative safety of warehouses fearing bombs and looting if a war starts. As the threat of war inched closer, the U.S. advised the United Nations on Monday to withdraw its inspectors from Baghdad. Countries closed their embassies and some foreign journalists left the country. It also ordered all government dependents and non-essential staff out of Kuwait, Syria, Israel and the West Bank and Gaza. Several Western countries have also told their citizens to leave neighboring Kuwait. Britain and Canada advise all of their citizens except diplomatic staff to leave Kuwait as soon as possible. They cited the risk of war and terror attacks in the Middle East. Also on Monday, United Nations observers halted all operations along the Iraqi-Kuwait border, moving to a heightened state of alert a day after Washington posed the one-day deadline for diplomacy to avert war. 
The last of the United Nations observer mission left their post on the border and drove in a long convoy to a UN compound in Kuwait City. is focused on Iraq that will soon become the target of a U.S.-led offensive, Israel seemingly exploited the international atmosphere and perpetrated overnight a new massacre against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Israeli occupation troops killed nine Palestinians, including a baby and youth, in an incursion of the Nusayrat refugee camp in Bethlehem. The scene of Israel's latest war crimes was in the Palestinian refugee camp of Nusayrat in the Gaza Strip, where the Israeli occupation army overnight killed nine Palestinians and wounded more than 15 others. Some 30 armored vehicles and bulldozers with infantry forces invaded the camp. Among the dead was a baby identified as Hanan al-Assar. She received a bullet in the head. Two other people were crushed under the rubble of a house dynamited by the occupation army as it raided the camp south of Gaza City. Two more Palestinians were also shot down in another Israeli aggression in the town of Beit Lahia in Gaza. The men in their 20s were identified as Shadi Akhras and Ramiz al-Asdudi. They were killed while Israeli forces fired gunshots after they ordered residents to gather in a school in the area. The latest massacre Israel perpetrated increased fear among Palestinian officials that Israeli occupation forces will use the looming U.S.-led war against Iraq to increase its aggressions. The Israeli government is, is really uh, engaging in a serious escalation that may lead to the full occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And we call upon the world leaders to introduce the roadmap immediately. This new massacre came after an Israeli army bulldozer crushed to death a U.S. peace activist, 23-year-old Rachel Corey, who was protesting against house demolitions in the Gaza Strip. Protesters who were with Corey said the bulldozer drove deliberately at her, knowing that she was there. The bulldozer drove up and it kept going and she tried to move back but she couldn't move back and she got caught underneath. She got caught underneath the bulldozer and it drove and it kept going even after it was very clear that she was that she was not that she had not moved. Many other internationals began to surround the bulldozer and yell at it and tell us that there is somebody there and it did not stop. And it continued to move forward until she was directly underneath the bulldozer. Cory was rushed to the hospital where doctors said she died suffering severe skull and chest fractures and injuries in various parts of her body. Cory's parents spoke their grief at their daughter's convictions. She, was, she spent nights sleeping at wells in the southern Gaza Strip that were being bulldozed over. And, and she um, slept with families whose houses were threatened with demolition. And today, as we understand it, she stood for three hours trying to protect a house. As usual, Israeli military spokesman Jacob Dalal said the death was an accident and the bulldozer driver was not arrested. However, an investigation was still underway. In this context, the U.S. State Department declined to condemn what it called the tragic incident, but said it had made clear to the Israeli government it expected a thorough probe. Iraq has called the three-way talks in the Azores on Sunday a summit of outlaws and said U.S. President George W. Bush and his British and Spanish allies have failed to prove their claims that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Meanwhile, U.S. weapons inspectors have continued supervising the destruction of a Sumut 2 missiles at a Taji military complex north of Baghdad despite looming war. After the three-way summit between George W. Bush, Tony Blair, and Jose Maria Aznar in the Azores, declared Monday a final day of diplomacy, UN inspections continued in Iraq on Monday, but the question was, for how long? On Monday, UN inspectors visited two missile factories near Baghdad at Ibn al-Haytham and al-Karama, still going through the motions of enforcing Security Council Resolution 1441. We have done everything and we will continue to cooperate with the Security Council and with all efforts all over the world in order to avert the aggression against our country. But if they put us with no other alternative, we have to defend our country and we will do that. 
The Iraqi President Saddam Hussein said the accusation that Iraq still had banned weapons was a great lie and warned that if Iraq were attacked, it would take the war anywhere in the world, wherever there is sky, land, or water. The Iraqi leader said Iraq would be victorious in any showdown with the United States because simply they are on the side of falsehood. His foreign minister, Naji Sabri, vowed Sunday that Baghdad would bury the aggressors seeking to invade his country. Sabri, speaking after a welcome Coming Tunisian Prime Minister on a visit to Baghdad said the United States and its allies face the opposition of the whole world in their intention to start war against Iraq. The Americans put themselves against the world, against the people first of all, and they have got a warning in that they have failed to get the world's support. They have a narrow margin of support in the Security Council and the world. They have spoken about their plans for colonialism, which is rejected by all. In Iraq, we are already in two fronts. First, full cooperation with the inspectors so that they can fulfill their duties according to the UN resolution, and this is clear commitment. On the second front, we are prepared to kill the aggressors in the Iraqi desert. Those those who put a foot on Iraq will not leave alive. Earlier on Sunday, Sabri said Iraq was preparing for war as if it will happen in an hour and added that food supplies have been distributed to people to last till the end of August. Already the Iraqi president has gone on war footing on Sunday by dividing Iraq into four military districts. U.S. and British troops continue their deployment and training ahead of war. Chemical protection exercises are being conducted in the Gulf and US military equipment continue to flood into Turkish ports and transported into bases. This report has more. Crammed around the small radio, U.S. Marines in the Gulf listened intently to their president's words in the Azores summit that indicated they will soon be in action against Iraq. A U.S. news channel reported that American military sources said a date for the air and ground invasions has already been set and they are just waiting for the go-ahead light from Bush. In the meantime, the USS Harry Truman is at the heart of one of the two U.S. battle groups that are expected to be moved to the Red Sea and then to the Persian Gulf for war. The Truman battle group and the battle group with the USS Theodore Roosevelt are expected to move to the Red Sea in case the United States failed to win Turkish approval to let in US forces to open a northern front against Iraq. Already in the Persian Gulf is the USS Kitty Hawk and on board is the Black Knight squadron of the aging F-14 warplanes that would be replaced after its last operational deployment by the new F-18 Super Hornet. In the desert, a very bad weather of sandstorms is expected to rain over the region on Tuesday However, U.S. and British troops are carrying on their exercises, waiting for zero hours to come. As conditions are getting hotter and temperatures are expected to reach 40 degrees Celsius, Marines opened their vacuum-sealed bags and tried on their new chemical suits that are designed to be worn for only 45 days and practiced on dealing with any chemical attack as well as training on mine clearance. Meanwhile, the U.S. Army in Kuwait has shown off its heavy battle tank, the M1 Abrams, that is widely considered to be the most advanced land-fighting vehicle in the world. In the same context, British forces stressed they are fully trained and hoped a decision of attack would be soon taken. The Peninsula shields 8,000 troops of the Gulf Cooperation Council currently in Kuwait, and the Kuwaiti armed forces also say they are ready to defend Kuwait in case it comes under attack from Iraq during any conflict in the region. With the Gulf being fully ready to start war, the deployment in Turkey is not full yet. A convoy of around 40 U.S. military trucks headed from Iskenderun to the Turkish port of Tasuku on Monday. The port is likely to be a key staging post in any military conflict in neighboring Iraq if Turkey's parliament approves a government proposal to authorize the deployment of 62,000 American troops on Turkish soil. Islamic Revolution's leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei in a meeting with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad on Sunday stressed the need for pressing ahead with regional and international efforts to avert a war in the region. The leader welcomed Tehran Damascus cooperation in all areas, including the issue of Iraq, and added the U.S. by occupying Iraq and gaining control over the oil wells seeks to follow the path of the 18th century's colonialists. 
However, as the leader pointed out, the occupation of Iraq in a long time and realization of Washington's age-old objectives will not be feasible in view of the current circumstances. I tell the underlying changing the political geography of the region is something beyond the United States' power, adding the U.S. might be able to inflict damage on the region in short run, but the nation's resistance will finally strike a shattering blow to the United States and lead it to its collapse. The Islamic Revolution's leader then described the issue of Palestine as one of the most important international issues and reiterated the cause of Palestine should not be overshadowed by the Iraq crisis. Ayatollah Khamenei said Washington, by its presence in the region, also seeks to strengthen the Israeli Zionist regime and undermine the Intifada. However, as the leader asserted, the resistance of Palestine and Lebanese people, as well as those by other regional nations, will lastly create another Vietnam for the United States. For his part, the visiting Syrian president termed the regional situation as highly critical and called for closer cooperation and continued consultations between Tehran and Damascus. Opposing military attack on Iraq, Iran and Syria put emphasis on peaceful solution to Iraq's standoff as possible solely under the implementation of the United Nations resolutions. Iranian and Syrian heads of state, Mohammad Khatami and Bashar al-Assad, in their talks in Tehran on Sunday, called the current situation in the region and the world as warring and reiterated the American officials should respect the world's public opinion. Uh, Mr. Khatami and Assad then supported Iraq's territorial integrity and stressed Iraqi people themselves should determine their own fate. Syrian president wrapped up his one-day visit to Tehran on Sunday. The Islamic Revolution's leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, a decree on Sunday appointed members of Iran's Supreme Cultural Revolutions Council for a new three-year term of office. Meanwhile, attending the Supreme Cultural Revolution Council as legal members will be the heads of the country's three branches, the ministers of culture and Islamic guidance, science, research and technology, health as well as education, the presidents of the Organization of the Islamic Republic of Iran's Broadcasting, IRIB, plus those of the Management and Planning Organization and the Islamic Propagation Organization, representatives from the religious jurisprudence at universities, the Women's Cultural and Social Council, the Islamic Free University, besides heads of parliamentary commissions of education and research, culture and health. Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Hamid Reza Safi, talking to reporters in Tehran on Sunday, strongly lashed out at U.S. officials' statements and reiterated Washington's recommendations do not work for the Iranian nation. The Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman asserted Tehran suggests American officials try to save their government from crisis resulted from unilateralism instead of interfering in other countries' affairs. The Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman terming the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell's recent remarks about reforms in nuclear activities in Iran as blatant intervention in Iran's domestic affairs and mentioned such remarks by U.S. officials in fact put under question the outcome of the International Atomic Energy Agency's chief's recent visit to Iran. The Sassafi then characterized Iran's nuclear activities as absolutely peaceful and transparent and also based on international treaties. The Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman, meanwhile, referring to Bush administration's decision on extending sanctions against Iran, underlines such a decision was far from surprising, which fits in the framework of the U.S. irrational policies. The Sassafi further turned to American senators' recent resolution, which calls for looking into what they called violation of human rights in Iran, and said the measure is an obvious interference in Iran's domestic affairs. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support provided by Henry and Virgilia Dakin.